Kia ora and welcome to the CARE COVID-19 lecture series. Today's lecture is one of the most exciting lectures for this series, at least for me. And uh, I will open uh, this conversation by expressing our gratitude to the many Bengali brothers who work as low wage migrant workers in Singapore and who have been part of uh, the ongoing work that CARE has been doing and who have lent their bodies to the many struggles by placing their bodies on the line uh, to speak truth to power. Our collectivist activist interventions, including our own work at CARE, are anchored in many of your voices, your strength, and your courage. Amadeir Bangali Bhayera, Apna Ramadeir Jara join Kurechen E. Alochunai, Apna Deir Oshon Kudhunnobat. Amrajke, Singapore Dui activist, Jadir Kapnara Hotoniki Chenin, Kokilan Namalai, our Jolovan Wam, Onade Shate, Covid nineteen, Shromik Deir, Molik, Onoitik, Othikar, Eguluni, Alochuna Kurbo. Shurukochi, Koviguru Romdranathir, Ekti Kovita Die. Nibolechen, Chitto Jetha Boishunno, Utso Jetha Shid, Gan Jetha Mukto, Jetha Grihir Prachir. Apun Prangon Tole, Dibo Shorbori, Boshudhare Rakhenai Khondo Khudro Kori. To our global audience, welcome to this conversation on COVID-19, migrant health crisis, and communicative equality. We will begin with a few stanzas from the poetry of Ramdanath Tagore, which I just recited in Bengali, that reflect the ethos of the conversation today. Tagore writes, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depths of truth. It is this truth and how to speak this truth that we will be exploring today. That the neoliberal status quo that has consolidated tremendous power and wealth in the hands of political and economic elites while simultaneously deepening extreme inequalities across the globe needs to be urgently transformed is a lesson that emerges in the midst of this pandemic. A number of global activists from Naomi Klein to Arundhati Roy register this urgent moment for transformative politics, urging us to imagine new possibilities. The work before us though in many ways is to go about thinking how we imagine these possibilities. How do we go about achieving this transformation is the key question of the hour. Extreme neoliberal reforms across the globe are catalyzed often by authoritarian repression through various techniques of legalities, through various techniques of disciplining, and in other instances through incarceration and use of violence. Singapore models the experiments with techniques of surveillance and repression to silence voices of dissent, often codified into various forms of normative organizing of politics, economics, communities, and society. These technologies and techniques of disciplining and control often are exported then globally in the form of the Singapore model as a pedagogy of governance to enable extreme uh, neoliberal ex ex extraction. Now consider the corollary of this argument then. The lesson in resisting authoritarianism and neoliberal extraction learned from Singapore offer urgent imaginaries for organizing social change processes in the contemporary context. If the production of fear is the primary tool for achieving authoritarian control, learning how to dismantle this fear both within and in the collective body of the public will offer us pathways potentially for transformation. We are lucky to have with us today two of Singapore's most courageous activists who by living the ethic of placing the body on the line model for us these principles of fearlessness, solidarity, care, and most vitally for this conversation and for our work at CARE, a commitment to creating communicative equality to building infrastructures for the voices of the margins. Amid the COVID-19 clustered outbreaks in migrant worker dormitories in Singapore, the voice of Kokila Namalai, a community advocate, organizer, and CARES community researcher, 
emerged as a register for witnessing the poor living conditions, the poor food being delivered to the workers by the caterers, and the anxieties workers experienced regarding their living conditions, food, and wages. In a climate that is quick to come up with band-aid solutions, often couched as altruism, her ongoing activist work drew consistent attention to the structural issues constituting the lives and livelihoods of low-wage migrant workers in Singapore. For doing this work, she was targeted by trolls and hegemonic structures. For consistently drawing attention to the broader structural issues in Singapore that constitute low-wage migrant labor. In solidarity with Kokila and other activists, wrote our other um, activist participant in this conversation, Jolovan, in a piece in the online citizen titled Advocacy, Activist Harassment and Solidarity, Kokila revealed that the online abuse also got worse um, when the Home Affairs and Law Minister K. Shamugam insinuated that she was spreading falsehoods for publicizing photos of poorly prepared and inadequate meals. As if on cue, the internet brigade of trolls were unleashed." End quote. This ongoing harassment, however, has not deterred her, as Kokila's fearless voice offers us an inspiring narrative for change, witnessing the various forms of structural marginalization. She makes one of the most critical points in this framework of interventions, and that is that the rights of the low-wage migrant workers to speak freely without the fear of censure is at the heart of worker well-being. Welcome, Kokila. We're also joined today by my friend and CARES activist in residence, Jolovan Wong. The one voice that has been at the forefront of witnessing and transforming the poor labor conditions that constitute low-wage migrant work in Singapore is that of Jolovan's. I don't think too many people would disagree with me when I say that Jolovan has been one of the key forces in bringing about many transformations in the landscape of migrant work-related policies. As a social worker advocating for low-wage migrant workers, and as former executive director of the Humanitarian Organization for Migrant Economics, or HOME, Jolovan has played a key role in shaping a range of policies we witness in Singapore today around the question of migrant labor including a weekly day off for migrant workers, the Prevention of Human Trafficking Act, and the Foreign Employee Dormitories Act, to name a few. The recognition, however, that these changes need to be anchored in structural transformation has guided his activism with civil obedience, um, civil disobedience, freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly. Through his various activist performance performances, including the uh, most recent ones, holding a placard with a smiley face emoji while wearing a mask uh, to performing a protest on Singapore's mass rapid transit system or the MRT, Jolovan's fearless activism is a register for courage. It creates a register for transforming Singapore by seeding a very simple principle, and that is one of challenging and overcoming fear, and through that, building infrastructures for spaces for voice. So Koki and Joe, welcome. It is such a delight to have you both, uh, two of my favorite activists as part of this conversation and looking forward to learning from you. Koki, now off to you. You know, thank you, Mohan, for having me and Jolivan share today. Um, I, I'm going to start by trying to share my screen first. Uh, one second. Okay. I hope everyone can see that. Um, so I can't see myself or anyone, so it's a bit <laughs> unnerving, but. I'm going to try and um, do this anyway. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna start by kind of sharing some examples of um, the communicative inequalities that I have come across in this period um, that workers 
have shared with me and that they're experiencing, and then tie it to you know, broader mechanisms, um, systematic mechanisms that work to silence workers' voices, and how we can then imagine uh, what the work looks like to expand the space for their uh, expression, um, for their opinions, and for their for their demands for change um, in this climate. Um, so I will also read out some of the quotes that I've chosen. This is something that a worker um, who lives in Tuasview dormitory said to me about what happened when he tried to provide feedback to his um, dormitory management about the food quality. So he says, the food was always watery, undercooked, tasteless. We didn't say anything. But one day when we got spoiled food and all the men in my room didn't eat, I felt sad. I went to ask the dorm staff very nicely if they would please help us pass feedback to MOM that the food today was spoiled. They abused me in Tamil. They said dogs from India don't deserve even this. What we're getting is already too much. Either eat what is given or starve. One of them told me uh, to shut my hole. And, and the worker told me that this was it said very crassly in a way that was deeply humiliating to him. He says, um, I felt indignant and I retorted. They then threatened to beat me and to cut off food to my room. I felt helpless and returned. So this is you know, one of many examples of the, the humiliation and intimidation that workers experience in trying to provide feedback about um, unjust conditions and inhumane um, treatment that they're receiving. Um, this is another quote where the worker says, I want to go back home I tried to ask them in the early days of the outbreak if I can go back. The company has my passport. I asked the engineer and foreman to please cancel my work permit. They're Chinese, so I don't know what they're saying to each other. They kept delaying the response to me. It's not that they forgot. So I was waiting and waiting, and he said, we're busy, call later. I checked again and again. They kept saying they forgot, they're busy. Then he said he'll tell me the next morning. When I asked them the next morning, they again made excuses. And then when I kept bugging them, they said HR is very busy and they can't get tickets. Five to six days passed like this, and then India went into lockdown. So I couldn't return anymore. So again, I think it's, a, it's an example of the, the ways that workers keep trying to speak up for themselves, to um, use the channels that are available to them, and then the evasion and um, and stonewalling that they face when they when they do that. Um, this is a continuation of his account. He says a lot of workers started leaving in January when the when the virus problem started. So our employers pressured the rest of us to stay, saying Singapore has the facilities. We will take care of you. They also said if you go back now, you can never come back to Singapore, and they won't give you a permit to ever return. They used this to threaten some workers who wanted to leave. The government announced that work permit holders who are overseas on home leave can't return till the situation improves, but this was misrepresented to us. I think if our employers knew there would be a lockdown in Singapore dorms, they would have let us go because then we're useless to them, but they didn't expect it, and now we are in this mess. If they had given us the freedom to return, been honest about the situation, most of us would have returned home and this problem wouldn't be so bad now. We could have come back when the situation was better. So I think this also speaks to the um, deception that workers often experience, um, where, where you know um, realities and facts are misrepresented to them to the advantage of those in power, whether these be dorm operators or employers or the government uh, at different times. And because they have so few um, channels to access information in languages that uh, are their first languages, then they often have to rely on and believe the authority of their employers and dorm operators, even when they're just saying things to intimidate them or they're lying so as to get their way. And I think one of the things that the worker pointed out to me was that, um, in his view at least, honesty would have helped everybody in that if most of the workers had, had returned home, um, the density in the dorms would have been far less and the, the breakout wouldn't have been so bad. So he was contesting the government's uh, repeated assertion that the workers are safer here than they would have been in their home countries. Um, and, and he says, you know, this wouldn't have been the case because our countries uh, back home, things are much more spaced out and, and, you know, we wouldn't all have been 
you know, it, it trapped in an environment where we would um, be so vulnerable to the virus. Um, so this was a really interesting conversation where um, Zwaka talks about the, uh, you know, he contests this narrative that workers are so full of gratitude and praise for the government, um, which we've seen on multiple platforms. And he tries to address and unpack why this might be happening, right? He says, our Tamil workers' comments on K uh, Minister Shanmugam's videos say he's God. So much praise. Have you seen them? It's hilarious. It's because they're all afraid. They're panicking. Why do so many workers say everything's great? They're afraid that if they complain, things will get even worse. They're living in fear. Everyone feels surveilled, monitored. People are afraid to write anything critical or even speak to their friends privately. One of my friends was sending forwards about COVID and I told him not to because there's a lot of fake news going around. Soon after, Dom Security called him up and warned him, told him not to send such forwards anymore. They also, um, I didn't include it here, but they also threatened him with legal consequences if he was to do that. Uh, he continues, they even brought up the fact that I had tried to discourage him. How did they know? Most workers think, why speak up and invite trouble? You think about it. How can we be happy in these conditions? If we're trapped like broiler chickens in a cage, waiting to get infected, without even the comfort of decent food or ventilation, how can we be happy? But to pretend is to survive. These are the same workers who are making satirical memes about the chief minister and prime minister in India. Because there, despite all the problems, we have the freedom to speak. We have civil rights. But here, we don't have that freedom. Um, you know, this really struck me that, that he was talking about how his friends are actually really political. And they have a lot of opinions and are very critical of, um, of you know, government, uh, of, of repressive government actions. But yet, um, they, they have this cognitive or, or this double conscious, you know, where they, where they act in one way when it comes to Indian politics, but then are forced to respond differently in Singapore because their rights are so curtailed. And it also, I think, gives us a perspective to think about um, taking the, the, the narratives of, of gratitude and of um, thanks and of, and of um, you know, uh, praise of Singapore's actions with a pinch of salt when it comes from workers. Um, and, and, and of course, not that workers may not, are not at all, uh, it's not possible for them to feel gratitude. I think it's also important to recognize that there is a, a diversity in workers' perspectives too, and, and not everybody feels obviously the same way, but I think these are helpful um, lenses through which to try to make sense of the, the different narratives that we see um, emerging from the migrant worker community. Um, regarding health communication, some of the uh, feedback that workers have given is that they're not often informed of their COVID-19 test results. Um, they face great difficulty getting medical care for emergencies as well as chronic health issues. Uh, they treat it with contempt when they ask for help. Um, you know, there was a worker who was trying to get his blood pressure medication for three weeks. Um, and another one who was uh, having profuse sweating and, and you know, it was, his body was in distress and yet the dorm operators told him that um, he wouldn't be able to get any medication or go out and didn't provide any alternatives. Uh, there have been workers who you know, tried for weeks to get just Panadol and were told that they couldn't and if they really you know, were so desperate, they would have to call an ambulance and pay $150 for the ambulance to go to the hospital just to get Panadol, right? So I think um, on top of the lack of access I think the contempt they face worsens, um, obviously, the, the, this experience of disempowerment from not being able to um, get access to the things that they need. Uh, also, you know, doctors have given many accounts of how workers arrive in the hospital, confused, panicked, or why, unaware of why they're there, uh, what treatment they'll receive, you know, what, how serious their condition is. Um, and many are also not informed of healthcare protocols like what it requires for them to be um, taken to hospital. Like, you know, do you, do you go to hospital just because you have a fever or do you, you know, have to need drips? So that there's a lot of confusion and panic because of um, this lack of information provided to them. And there are also, um, so far, no efforts to my, to my knowledge to provide translators, whether in the dorms or in the hospitals. And all the efforts at translations so far um, through these websites and, and helplines has been provided by volunteer efforts and, and none uh, by state efforts. Uh, also, 
there's a lot of barriers they face in day-to-day -day communications also. These are all issues I've written about previously, but just to reiterate, you know, they have um, new roommates moved in without explanation. Um, they're moved, shuttled about from accommodation to accommodation, a facility to facility without explanation as to why, when, you know, they're just asked to pack their bags in a moment's notice. Uh, even within their dorms, they move to different levels without explanation. Um, and again, they face contempt if they try to ask for explanations. Uh, you know, sometimes for days, the cleaning is stopped. They don't understand why. Um, and there's little clarity around their rights, right? They still don't understand um, if they're meant to be paid their full salaries or if the healthcare they're going to receive is free. So there's, you know, immense difficulties in, on all these levels. Currently, as I, as I understand it, the feedback channels that workers have is either the worker gets to, uh, has to approach dorm management or dorm security, who will then approach the FAST teams with their feedback. Um, or if it is for some other types of issues, uh, and in the factory converted dorms and temporary accommodations where there are no FAST teams, then the worker is expected to contact their employer who then will contact MOM. So this, these are the channels that they've been asked to rely on. Now the difficulty is that the intermediary in both these instances, employers and dorm management need to be supportive and cooperative, right? And this is the kind of issue that has persisted in workers' experiences that they are dependent on the benevolence of um, their, their you know, um, paymasters and, and of the dorm management. And so in the cases where they're not cooperative or they're not sympathetic to what the workers are saying or they're hostile to them, then the worker needs to rely on, and, and so this is what hap ends up happening in a lot of cases, needs to rely on a connection to an NGO or an activist or a Singaporean friend who will then flag the issue to MWC, who will then contact the fast teams. And this is a really um, roundabout way of getting help. And a lot of workers, don't have these connections to NGOs. They don't have connections. They don't have Singaporean friends, right? They don't have local ties who can advocate on their behalf. So that's um, a very concerning dimension of this, of their predicament. Um, yeah. So what I think it's like uh, beyond what challenges workers are facing in communication now, it's um, helpful to look at the systematic mechanisms that underpin these communicative inequalities, right, that that have um, that are now worsened during a pandemic, uh, the fact that workers have no right to unionize and that there's a uh, they're reliant on a tied what we call a tied work permit system, where their employment is tied to a particular employer who can cancel their work permit at any time, who pays a security bond um, um, to to hire the worker and who has complete control over this worker's movements, salary uh, and everything and who can, you know, so, so they're com completely at the mercy of their workers. And this means that it's very difficult for them to speak up when there are abuses at the workplace. Um, the debt burden is also another systematic mechanism that works in effect to silence them because they, they can't often afford to be sent back home. Uh, or to be blacklisted or you know anything like that and you know we know how even singaporeans and and um permanent residents fear speaking up in singapore let alone um workers whose you know the cult the, the i think the conditions of fear are so much deeper in their experience um you know we've seen how even uh, academics and uh, ep holders and all that can be can be you know barred from staying in singapore through like a refusal to renew their permits and things like that. And all of this is exacerbated for work permit holders. I think another another thing that makes it very um, prohibitive for workers to speak up is that their access to justice through the um, justice system is, is heavily limited because the, the, the odds are so stacked against them. Sometimes they hear, you know, if they file a complaint or a report, they can be stuck here for up to a few years while the case is being processed. and. And in that time, their access to employment is diminished. They're, some of them aren't able to work. Um, and the outcomes are often, to them, not worth it, right? Because it could be that you weren't paid your salary for, for a year, but in the end, the employer is only ordered to pay you um, a few months' worth. Um, so, and, and there's lots of different kinds of offenses that 
are not taken seriously enough to investigate. And they also find that the consequences that are, are dealt to employers are not severe enough. Um, and, and very rarely do employers you know, face prosecution because of their treatment of workers. So, you know, I, I talked about the right, the, the lack of right to unionize, and I think this is illustrated by this other quote from a worker uh, where he talks about the issues uh, that stem from the lack of a collective voice. So he says, our work ends at 10 p.m., but sometimes the lorry only comes at 11 p.m. to pick us. Some of us get angry that we've been working since 8 a.m. and we haven't had dinner. Even though there are rules that they have to get us food if it's past 8.30 p.m., they don't because it's so remote. And he's referring to the area they're working. Sometimes they give us money instead of food, but we can't buy food in that area. The problem is that the 30 of us who've been waiting can't be united in questioning this. Aren't we humans who deserve to eat and rest? If one or two of us complain, they will say, okay, if it's so hard for you, no more overtime for you, and they punish us. So those of us who speak up feel like fools. So this is the predicament that workers face in speaking up when they don't have access to collective bargaining um, and to organizing themselves so that the risk of speaking up can be mitigated. Uh, when it, it's so great when it's a single voice or just a couple of voices, it's easy for employers to censure them. Um, so I, I thought this was a really uh, powerful anecdote to talk about how you know, that reflects how the, the lack of voice of workers is something that agents, employers, everyone thinks about and designs into the recruitment process, right? So here the worker says, recently my friend told me about how his company applies for S-Pass for their workers and collect $9,000 fees for this. The employer and the agent split the fees. So these are kickbacks for the employer, right? The employer will tell the Indian agent to recruit someone who is timid, who won't talk back, who's from very desperate conditions. Indian agents can tell this from their accent and background. If you hire him for a $2,800 salary, they come with hope. Most of them can learn quickly and are educated. But when he comes, the employer will tell him, oh, the agent told me you had all these skills, but you don't. The worker will say he can learn, but he's told no, since you don't have the skills, I'll give you only $600, and if you don't want it, you can go back. The agent will point out to him how many thousands are spent to get him here. Because of the debt the boy is in, because he has to pay interest, he thinks about his family's condition and accepts. They transfer the salary that they're meant to and collect it back. $2,800 salary, but you have to return most of it. People don't do much because we are desensitized and we don't have hope or channels to get justice. So, you know, I think he, he reflects on a few different issues here, right? The, the habituation of abuse that then also uh, inhibits speaking up, but also how they're, they're selected for their vulnerability that then makes it um, much harder for them to speak up to. So um, I want to reflect for a bit on, you know, workers' voices that we've heard in public discourse at this time. Uh, one of the examples that stands out to me a lot is this <laughs> Facebook page called True Life of Singapore Migrant Workers. And it's um, to me quite interesting that all the admins, uh, as you can see in this image here, are Singaporeans. Um, it, I'm, I'm unclear as to their as to their backgrounds, but they, they run the page. and um, the, the content there is so interestingly curated, right? So for, you know, when the pandemic uh, in, uh, and the, especially the outbreaks in the dorms were intensifying, I was observing lots of um, critical posts from workers on the page all of a sudden. And each time they would post something within, uh, you know, that, that pointed out what was not being done right or how unfairly they felt they were treated, they would immediately within minutes be, um, very harsh, abusive um, comments from others on the page, Singaporeans by the um, looks of it, or locals at the very least. And, and, and they would be um, attacked very um, you know, vehemently. And then um, some of us tried to step in to respond to those negative comments and engage with them. But I saw that within a few days, there were no more posts like that. Um, so I don't know what happened but those uh, critical posts disappeared after a few days. And instead we had, I, I started to see a lot of workers 
or uh, at least they, in their names and in how they identified themselves, they were workers, posting um, you know, photos of Singapore flag and Lee Sien Long and saying how much they love Singapore, how happy they are, how grateful they are. Um, I just found it really fascinating. And, and I, don't, I don't know what is going on behind the scenes, but I, I do think that it's kind of something we need to look at more deeply is, is how workers' participation is um, censored, filtered, curated when they speak up on <clears throat> public platforms. Um, and whether they are, you know, there, there are workers who are incentivized to or planted to say certain things. Again, I'm not questioning that there can be legitimate voices of gratitude from workers, but I think some of these patterns and dynamics of how the, the discourse develops do need to be scrutinized a bit more closely. Um, I think I worry about the fact that workers' voices are at risk of being co-opted into both state narratives as well as counter narratives, right? There, um, you know, the state uses a lot of workers um, um, sharing with them, oh, you know, the food was great today, thank you, and all of those kinds of comments, and they screenshot it, and then they paint a narrative of how generous and be benevolent they are, and then they also require the mainstream media to publish these um, comments. And um, um, I think also with regard to counter narratives, I think there, there are also, you know, um, activists or people who, um, um, you know, are critical of the state's narrative who sometimes use workers' accounts um, or perspectives without their consent. And I think that is quite, um, you know, it is something that needs a lot more uh, care when we do. Um, uh, Rep try to, when we do represent workers' voices, uh, there needs to be a lot more carefulness in how it's done, I think. Um, I think also there is often uh, a pre-existing narrative that, that some people who are critical of the state might have, and then they look for workers' opinions or stories or examples that they can fit into this narrative that they've already formed, rather than letting workers' accounts and voices form the narrative for them. Right? I think that that can be a nuanced difference and something that we have to pay attention to. Um, there's also the difficulty that you know when workers are critical, they're often speaking anonymously, though though you know there have been some workers who've very bravely put their name to a lot of their comments. Um, but I think you know together with this anonymity comes then uh, this all these accusations of fake news of Oh, you know, you're not really on the ground. These are not first-hand accounts. How can you know? Like when activists or NGOs try to um, tell these stories that workers are telling them, but anonymously, then these are some of the ways that it is, you know, the, this attempts to discredit it. Um, I'm also quite uncomfortable with how the gratitude narrative is very strong, strongly projected by a lot of um, both state actors and civil society actors at times, right? Um, that I think sometimes um, glorifies the work that civil society in the state is doing rather than framing it as, as the rights of workers to, to receive this care and uh, support at this time. Um, and I also worry about how sometimes positive portrayals can be as objective, objectifying and disempowering as negative portrayals, right? Um, so Josephine Teo says in one of her posts, you know, that uh, all workers are stepping up to help with some operations in the dorms and you know we don't often get to see them as leaders and yet when the going gets tough some rise to the occasion and and i found this quite patronizing and um, you know there's lots of also videos on some of these web um, pages like true life of singapore migrant workers that will like um show videos of workers like cleaning or or participating in some things and then like saying like you know it's kind of like a it can be a <laughs> I, I find it difficult, right? Because I think it's it's very nuanced. Sometimes it can be, depending on how it's framed, something that is amplifying the ownership and agency that workers have. And the um, but I think often it also falls into this well-behaved workers type of narrative that is um, reinforces some notions. Um, and and I think it also tends to like be this whole like justifying uh, why they they are not unclean, justifying why they are not. Um, you know, uncivilized, and and I, should we have to do that? I, I, it's you know, it's quite tricky. I think, though, I, my thoughts on that are not very coherent, clearly. <laughs> um, I the other thing that I've noticed is also that I often find that workers' perspectives are not embedded in discourse, 
they're just used in discourse, right? They're not active free agents who are dialoguing with us. Um, their voices are still curated in many ways. It's like the work workers say something and then we, the rest of us are debating that uh, reality, right? They're not necessarily embedded in, in this dynamic of discourse. Um, and so true dialogue is quite rare to come by, I think. Um, so th there's also, I still very much, and this is something that you know, I feel like a bit of a broken record about because I keep saying, but there's still a very dominant focus, not just with migrant workers, but with many marginalized communities that there's a focus on inviting and asking for their stories, which sometimes to me feels quite voyeuristic and minimizing that, that all they can share are like, their, their pain, right? That's not all they can share. It's, there's very rarely their opinions and analysis and response to Singaporeans' criticism of them, for example, is invited. Um, so this is something a worker said to me on Singaporeans' criticism of workers wasting good food, right? So he says, no one needs to teach us about the value of food. Singaporeans certainly don't need to teach us about the value of food and not wasting food. Most of us come from farming communities and have worked with the soil, produced food. So how bad does it have to be for us to throw it away? Um, this was really um, affecting for me to hear. And I thought it was such an important um, response to the you know, um, very vile criticism that Singaporeans were, were mounting on migrant workers at the time when they were uh, accused of throwing away all this uh, inedible food. And he says to me, you know, but I can't write in English. So when I read all this online, I feel angry and I think all these thoughts, but I can't say it back to them. So I think that's kind of what I um, have observed in terms of lack of their space to respond uh, and therefore meaningfully participate in dialogue. Um, I think many people have seen this um, poem by Zachary. It's so beautiful and powerful. And actually the whole piece is um, speaks a lot to the lack of freedom of expression and voice, right? So many stanzas and the piece start with, we are afraid to speak um, our minds. And, but these two in particular stood out to me because they um, comment on how even those of us who, who uh, you know, mean to be supportive of workers or align with them and, um, <clears throat> and who position ourselves as allies might curate, censor, and um, try to make their stories more palatable and the restrictions that we continue to face in, in being able to meaningfully create space for their voice. Uh, he talks about how you know, journalists um, who approach them also are too fearful because they're, they're, you know, workers are afraid of talking to journalists and journalists are afraid of someone else, right? And also how um, the, the Singaporeans or locals who, who work with them on, on their art and collaborate on creative work also can be in, involuntarily engaging in um, censoring their expression or tone policing, like what is palatable, what is acceptable for them to say. Um, this is another quote from a worker about reporters, right? He says, reporters speak to me and they say, we are on your side, but we can only write to a limit because we have instructions from editors, it's out of our hands and so on. In India, our reporters write with courage. Um, he, also, and a lot of workers have talked about, and we see, right, as, as I think um, um, volunteers or activists who are sometimes in between journalists and workers, because journalists approach us asking for workers to speak to, for their accounts uh, to fit into certain stories. And sometimes, you know, the despite the journalist's best intentions, um, what the worker says is misrepresented because of certain editorial decisions. And it's really painful when that happens because it you know, uh, violates the trust of the worker and it leaves them very vulnerable to um, sometimes state backlash or just the, 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 the agony of being misrepresented. And there's also here, you know, something I hear from journalists a lot is this, like, oh, we need to tell both sides of the story as something that's used to shut down a story completely because when a worker shares or makes an accusation about something that happened in their dorm. And then the journalist is unable to get a response from the dorm operator because the dorm operator just refuses to answer, um, even when they get them on the line. Then the journalist says, oh, but I didn't get the other side of the story, so I can't publish. Instead of saying, you know, in time for filing, we didn't get a response from so-and-so, or 
LinkedIn comment. They just don't publish it at all. So that's a very effective way to kill stories is by you know, those in power just not responding to queries from journalists too. Um, yeah, so I, those are some things. Huh, okay, so moving on to less depressing things. Uh, how do we expand, been thinking a lot about this too, how do we expand this space for workers' voices? Um, I mean, this is something that, you know, Mohan has written about too, and it just resonated with me a lot because I had been trying to write my thoughts on the same, um, a few days before I read his post, um, which is the, the amount of courage I've seen from workers uh, in this time. And, you know, there's been an unprecedented number of workers speaking up and on directly, like on MOM's page or like on, um, you know, Joseph Incio's page or some, like just responding to posts talking about how great the conditions are in the dorms or, you know, uh, all the propaganda about their food being great. And then they, they reply and in such, you know, unfiltered ways, like, and, and just, you know, matter of factly, right? Like, this is what's happening in my dorm. This is nonsense. This is propaganda. Like, they're just saying it like it is. And it's and at great risk, uh, a, a great personal risk, I think. And, I, and, and that has opened up the space for more and more workers to speak up, right? So it's not, I think, um, and I think this is, this is what we see as, as um, quite common when in an authoritarian environment, especially, I think it requires a lot of courage um, for the first few people to speak up. And then if, if more people take to the mantle, it becomes harder for the establishment to shut it down. Um, and, you know, these workers are not unaware of the risks that, that this poses, but I think it is also this great sense of urgency um, of, for the injustice that is happening at this point. Um, I think allyship is another way that uh, the space can be expanded. Um, to me, allyship means things like, you know, when, when people say, when, when workers speak and someone responds in a way that tries to shut them down, us engaging, like standing in solidarity in that space, like calling that, the, you know, the person who's trying to shut them down out, uh, things like that, or um, working alongside workers as, as allies and as peers rather than as decision makers of, on their behalf, right? So um, I think allyship is, is really helpful. And then there's more and more spaces where I think um, workers and Singaporeans or you know, locals are working alongside each other as peers. And I think that's really um, important. I think it also means a commitment to mitigating the um, backlash they will face when they speak up, right? So for example, um, if they're, um, you know, we, we feel that they're at risk for speaking up, I think it's important that more and more of us share the narrative that the worker is sharing, uh, share their post, share their article, um, because the more that it's visible that we stand with the worker, I think it is harder for uh, the establishment to shut them down or punish them because there will be the sense that we are watching. And if we are watching, then we will not let it go. So when, when, when workers do face consequences for speaking up, we have to speak up about that, right? We have to call out that injustice and try to hold the government accountable uh, or employers accountable for punishing them for speaking up. Um, we've also seen how, you know, art and creative resistance, um, often through migrant-led spaces, have expanded the space for workers' voices. Um, I've, you know, some examples on my slide here, I think these are great pages to follow um, because they are migrant-led spaces. Um, and um, migrants have used, I think, theater, film, poetry, really diverse mediums to share their narratives um, and, and analysis of, of their position in Singapore very meaningfully. Um, I think another area that is um, also quite prevalent in the migrant worker spaces, but maybe less visible to the public is the amount of mutual aid that exists um, uh, in the migrant worker community. There was a, a, a domestic worker support group that I um, helped to organize a few years ago. And it was uh, incredible to me to see the, the, the speed at which um, the women in the group, it was for Tamil uh, domestic workers. So the speed at which they were able to mobilize, rally different groups of domestic workers, um, identify cases of abuse, flag them up. Um, they would even negotiate with employers on behalf of other migrant, uh, on behalf of other domestic workers, right? So if a, if a domestic, if an employer was being abusive 
or wasn't you know willing to transfer the the worker other workers would call them up and advocate for them and say come on you know like i can help find her an employer you know just just help to transfer her and they would also find employers through their own networks so that domestic workers could transfer without having to pay agents fees that they would have to if they used an agency so i thought that was really you know it was really powerful to see and this happens all the time right migrant workers build their own infrastructures community infrastructures for helping each other and we need to be supporting amplifying and directing resources towards spaces like that and finally i think i mean we cannot um disconnect the ongoing advocacy for freedom of expression uh, labor rights in general the right to unionize and media freedom in singapore um from the struggle for migrant workers to have more voice because these are interconnected struggles so if you know jollivan is um holding up a, a a smiley face and getting into trouble for that well that's part of the work to expand the space for migrant workers voices too i think and, and i think it's helpful to be able to see those links um you know i'm taking up a lot of time i will try to finish quickly um involving workers in decision making is again something i've written about before uh workers of you know some a lot of the workers i've spoken to have shared with me many ways in which they wish they were part of um the, the decision making that's happening now um you know why aren't they part of the task force or coalitions making decisions about workers lives at this point um and you know the, it's it's very a bit it, it's i mean a lot of research has shown that and it's quite i think common sensical also to realize that when people are given ownership over their challenges uh, and to the solutions like where they're involved in coming up with the solutions they commit to the solutions more so you know with regard to things like safe distancing or you know stay home notices and where so many workers were deported for violating um these circuit breaker measures could instead not uh, workers have been more involved in thinking about how these measures should be implemented so that they could take more ownership for how uh, it's practiced and implemented too um you know the workers i've spoken to have many creative and practical solutions to the challenges facing workers in dorms right now whether it's sanitation or food security or communication and these voices would would make such a big difference to the crisis management and recovery if we um um leveraged on and invited their skills and expertise um and one of the things that you know a lot of them have taken initiative to do on their own is to be communication ambassadors those who've like uh, who have better uh, english um comprehension they, you know they they translate a lot of things to Bangladeshi and to Tamil and to different languages for fellow workers and these efforts need to be recognized and resources need to be directed towards them too. So kind of in closing I mean to me the, one of the most important questions is like how do we work alongside workers uh, and with them rather than for or on behalf of them. And um one of the like principles that I think is a helpful guiding force is to direct resources <clears throat> excuse me in the service of workers agency and not in the service of workers needs or perceived needs so like asking what do workers think need to be done and then directing resources towards that um you know we we know that uh, workers are very um at, at this point very heavily involved in providing community care for fellow workers you know they're running music sessions in their dorms um with you know just like using buckets and tabletops and things like that uh and singing and they're 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 leading exercise for other workers and meditation programs now is it is it is it essential that we create you know and and spend resources in parallel creating our own activities for them to participate in because you know that's what some groups do and i'm i'm not saying that that is bad but i'm saying could those efforts be redirected to what's looking at what workers are already doing and then strengthening that right rather than using resources to just create entirely new programs for entertainment or to engage workers at this time um and similarly you know with um decisions about food distribution uh, decisions about healthcare mass distribution sanitation they, they can be involved in all of these and the resources can be directed towards efforts that they're already making and I think centering workers agency dignity and rights uh, always in our work is um is really crucial um because sometimes I think uh, we can fall into a sort of protective kind of dynamic uh 
where where even when workers want to speak up or want to take certain actions, um, activists or NGOs feel a responsibility to protect them from backlash. And I think while this is well intentioned, it does undermine their agency. So as long as the workers are making informed decisions about what they want to do, um, I think our role is to support that and be in solidarity rather than try to protect them from uh, that, the, the work that they want to engage in too. Um, and also, you know, I think a distinction between a charity type of approach versus community response, right? Because so, community response centers those who are most affected by the reality as peers, leaders, and decision makers with agency and creativity. Um, while, you know, an altruism, generosity type of uh, narrative which i think does exist in civil society here and in the current pandemic response to migrant workers reinforces hierarchical notions of the helper and the helped um and 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 you know projects workers as passive agents uh and who are helpless and glorifies donors and volunteers or or kind employers who are you know so kind as to help their workers etc so i think those those do need to be interrogated and it requires a lot of self-reflexivity when activists or NGOs are glorified for us to check that and and challenge that and um, and and in disrupt those narratives too. Um, and yeah, I think finally, you know, um, these situations um, are always used by the state uh, and some powerful actors to divide civil society in different ways. So I think we have to actively contest that by extending solidarity um, to everyone and um, you know, regardless of you know what strategies and approaches they're taking, trying to um, um, yes, not let those forces divide us. And huh, okay, so it's my last slide. I think so. I just wanted to kind of say, like, in by saying like one or two thing, lines about what how I think about the work I do. Um, to me, it's really important to think about like who this narrative that the, the narrative I'm putting out. Who does it comfort? And who does it threaten? Who does it resonate with, right? And, and I don't, um, it, it matters most to me that my work is in solidarity with um, migrant workers in this context, but in generally, but generally speaking with those who are uh, dis disenfranchised. I think for, uh, it, is, it is not my starting point uh, to think about whether my work is pragmatic or efficient or strategic, which you know, many might see as a, as a flaw. Uh, and I'm you know, willing, I mean, I'm, I'm open to that critique. But um, I think it, it can be, it, it, I respect that that is other people, that can be other people's starting point, like to think about, you know, does my work open doors? Um, will, will, it, will it alienate policymakers? Will it alienate civil servants? Um, those are not my preoccupations. And I think it's healthy that we all are preoccupied with different things and are trying different strategies. So I think for me, the guiding factor is how migrant workers or other marginalized communities that I, I hope to extend solidarity to, um, what what is important to them, what are the narratives that they want forwarded, and what are the narratives that rights based organizations who work for their well being want forwarded. Okay, I am done. Thanks Hi. so much, Koki. Thank you so much. Uh, Jolovan, uh, if you would uh, now go ahead with your presentation and then we will come to the questions after the uh, two presentations. Okay. Um... Can everyone see my screen? Um, okay, I'll, I'll I'll just start. Yeah. Okay. So um, so Koki gave a pretty good like overview of how um, workers' voices are being marginalized and what are some of the things, um, the ways in which um, the state employers and other um, actors try to marginalize their voices. 
Um, in the 15 or so years that I've been involved in migrant rights activism, um, there have been some sparks, right? Um, there have been workers who have not been intimidated, and there have been workers who found um, solidarity among themselves um, to resist um, the structures and to empower themselves. So you see in this picture, um, this is a group of construction workers from China. Um, they had approached um, HOME, the organization that I was with, um, for assistance with their salary claims. Um, they had gone to MOM, but they felt that the Manpower Ministry wasn't doing enough to help them get back what was justly owed to them. So they decided to stage like a protest outside the Manpower Ministry building. So you can see the, the workers all gathered here. And there's also the Manpower Ministry officer at the left hand side, like trying to calm the workers down. Yeah, so, so this protest was actually going on for several days at the time. Yeah, and um, and it was quite, and, and the workers were quite um, relentless in their demands. And so this was actually really something which, at the time when it happened, it was really quite um, interesting because um, it's been because workers don't gen in, in Singapore generally are so marginalized, are so oppressed. They find it so difficult to stand up for themselves. They're so they find it so hard to assert themselves because of the precarity of their jobs. It's easy for them for their work permits to be cancelled and then they'll be sent back home. But here you have a bunch of workers who are actually willing to take the risk. So how then does a migrant rights activist or or anyone in general with more privilege um, um, magnify these voices? Uh, what can we do to show solidarity with them? Yeah. So at the time, um, I was in touch with a couple of these workers, and um, and as their and as a social worker, I had been talking to them about some of their options, and they had decided that they wanted to do this. Yeah. And they felt that this was the only way in which they could stand up for themselves and get what they wanted. So despite exploring those consequences to them and saying that, you know, you all, the whole lot of you could be arrested, you could be charged, you could be convicted, and you can't come back to Singapore again to work. Yeah, but they were willing to forego, some of them at least, yeah, the ones that I spoke to, they were willing to forego all of that. Yeah, so they proceeded to um, continue on with this protest. And one of the things that um, I did at the time together with a colleague to show solidarity was to provide them with meals and drinks while they were doing they are sitting outside the manpower ministry. Yeah. So even though I couldn't do much, um, I think little acts like this, um, sh uh, little acts of support like this, can boost morale, and 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 make workers feel that they are being supported. Yeah. So instead of saying things like, "Oh, you know, um, you shouldn't be doing this. It's illegal. What's illegal is wrong." I think it's important that if workers are standing up for themselves, that we are able to support them. And um, even if we can't stop the might of the state um, coming down on them, um, at the very least, what we can do is um, show little, li little acts, you know, like buying them drinks, buying them meals while they are doing their stage, their, their protests outside really helps. Yeah. So what happened in the end was I think in the, the workers' problems were all settled, um, but those who were seen to be key leaders of the protests, um, when when they were repatriated, they were not allowed to come back to Singapore to work because we, I, I got in touch with some of them and they told me that they couldn't come back again. But they said that they went back home to China with their head held high. Yeah, so so that was um, quite quite amazing. So this other slide um, involves a bunch of um, Chinese bus drivers who went on strike. Um, this was Singapore's first strike in 26 years. Um, the last strike was in, I think, 1988 or 1989, and it was a government-sanctioned strike. So this happened in 2012. Yeah, and what happened was that a bunch of these drivers were not happy because um, they were being paid less than their Malaysian counterparts. So the four men featured here were part of a... Uh, they, they, they were seen as the organizers of the strike. Yeah, so they were arrested and they were charged in court and eventually they were convicted. So at the time when this strike happened, um, the drivers were all painted in a pretty negative light. Um, whenever you saw pictures of them in mainstream media, they, 
were, they always looked, their heads were down and they looked sad. Yeah. So what me and a bunch of activists decided to do was to create a, a blog to reflect their voices. Yeah, and to tell, and, and, and basically tell accounts of what happened to them and to provide another perspective to what the mainstream media was telling. Yeah, so, so the blog then became a key site for, for these workers' perspectives to be told. Yeah, and one of the things that we did was um, we highlighted this petition, which they had earlier written to the Manpower Ministry, but which they didn't get a satisfactory response. So what this petition basically says um, is that they were very unhappy with their living conditions. And this is something which um, is being talked about now in light of the crowded dormitories and how the, the virus is spreading there. So, um, so these issues were already raised very early on. And, um, and the drivers were saying that because of the cramped conditions and the bed bug infested um, beds that they had to sleep in, they couldn't rest properly, and then and they are op and they're driving a bus, and this could be dangerous. So they wanted the manpower ministry to do something about it. They also complained that um, SMRT had taken their passports, and that the bonuses which were awarded to them were were were, were not fair. So they they wanted the manpower ministry to look into this. So when we asked them, so what happened to this petition that you had submitted? Um, they said that nothing came out of it. Yeah, so that's why many of the workers felt very hopeless and helpless. Yeah, but this is a story that's not told um, by the mainstream media. Yeah, so we decided to, to reflect it in our blog so that people can understand um, what the workers, why the workers wanted to go on strike and what was their situation. So um, this is a bus driver. His name is um, Hu Xiu Wen. So me and a friend, we um, actually took a trip to China yeah, to, to visit him and, and to talk to him and to find out what happened during his time at SMRT and why um, the workers eventually went on strike. So he, he complained about having to um, pay like $7,000 to recruiters in China just to come to, to Singapore for this job with SMRT as a driver. And, he's, and he said that a lot of the terms and conditions which were promised to him by the agents in China turned out to be quite different in Singapore. And he was quite disconcerted by the fact that his passport was taken from him and he didn't also have a copy of his contract. So, but the thing that bugged him the most again was the poor living conditions because he said that even when he was driving the bus, he would have to scratch himself because of, of the bed bugs and it was, it was very difficult for him to do his job because of the bed bugs biting him. So. In his, in his attempt to try and address this issue, um, the management at SMRT got angry. Yeah, he said that the HR manager banged the table, shouted at him, and, um, and he wasn't able to resolve the issue. And what the management did in the end was they got a repatriation company to, to seize him, to lock him up, and they sent him back. Yeah, so he was terminated very unceremoniously, and he was basically forcefully confined against his will by a security company and then he was just sent back. So this story kind of became quite a, became a cautionary tale among the drivers at SMRT, yeah, that there's nothing you can do um, to resolve your problems. Yeah, if you were to talk to the management, it, you might risk termination, and if you go to MOM, nothing's going to happen because they tried with their petition and they filed a complaint, but uh, nothing much was done about their situation. So, um, so this is one of the, the drivers who alleged that he was um, um, assaulted by police officers under custody when he was under custody. So when he was investigated, he said that police officers punched him. Yeah. Um, but what happened after this video was released by us with him t uh, recounting what happened, um, the filmmaker who made this video had her videos, had her laptop seized and she was investigated for prejudicing court proceedings. Okay, I'll show the next picture. Okay, this is another case. Um, it involves uh, workers from a factory in China. Uh, no, uh, workers, it involves uh, workers from China and they were working for Panasonic. And Panasonic was, uh, has, has a premises at Bedok and, and they were all very unhappy with their pay 
um, because they, their basic salary was just about five or six hundred dollars. And um, they had been asking for increment in their salary, but the company refused. And despite, and after a lot of persistent um, requests, the company finally decided to increase their salary, but increased it only by five dollars, which they felt was an insult. Yeah. So a whole group of them came to us for assistance, and um, they decided that um, the only way in which they could deal with this matter yeah, was to write a petition and to publicize it. Yeah. So, so what we did was we organized um, for them to, to raise their issues, uh, put it all in written form in the petition, and about, I think, almost 100 workers from this factory signed it, and it was given to the factory to Panasonic, and then it was publicized in the media. And simultaneously, what we did was we helped to file a, a, a complaint to um, the government in Japan about how the Panasonic factory is exploiting their workers in, in Singapore. So the outcome of this, um, this petition and this complaint that we filed to the Japanese government was that the workers did manage to get an increase in their salary, but it wasn't very much. It was $50, um, but they also managed to get their contracts um, translated into Chinese because previously Panasonic had only given them a, a contract in English and they all managed to get their passports back. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, an image of, uh, of a discussion session that, uh, of, of domestic workers um, talking about their rights. Yeah, so one of the things that we, is important is that um, workers themselves are able to organize these events and to talk about issues that matter to them. So this was a discussion um, in preparation for uh, the shadow report for the Convention for the Protection of uh, Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families um, to Indonesia. So, so Indonesia was due for a report to the UN about the situation of migrant workers' rights in their country. So we organized um, domestic workers uh, from Indonesia um, to come together. So there were about 20 or 30 domestic, worker, uh, domestic workers from who, who are leaders in their respective communities. So they came together and talked about issues that, that affected them and what they wanted to see in the report. Yeah, so stuff like um, unregulated working hours, exor exorbitant recruitment fees, uh, physical, verbal, sexual abuse of domestic workers. So these were a lot of the issues that were discussed and which eventually made it into the report and which they um, submitted to um, the UN and they also had a meeting with the Indonesian embassy to talk about these issues. So, these, so these, this is an example of one of the kinds of sessions that um, I have been involved in helping to organize so that um, workers themselves are able to, to speak and raise issues to their governments and also to international bodies. Okay, and um, this is a, a meeting with the Philippine Embassy. Um, so one of the things that we think is important in centering workers' voices is that they can also talk back, right? So, um, so this is a, a meeting that we organized with our key um, volunteers uh, who are Filipino domestic workers and to talk about the challenges that um, domestic workers in Singapore face to the embassies. It's often easier to um, arrange these kinds of sessions with the governments of their countries yeah, because to get the Singapore government to, to, to meet uh, migrant workers to talk about these issues would be a lot more difficult and there's also a lot more risk um, because um, because the, uh, the fear can be quite strong. People, many migrant workers might feel that if they are seen to be too involved in advocacy, policy issues with uh, the manpower ministry, with the Singapore government here, um, it might affect their employment. Yeah. So one of the ways in which we try to get around that is to organize for meetings for, their, for them to talk with their respective governments rather than with the Singapore government. Okay, and um, this is uh, a rally that we also organized um, for domestic workers. So um, this occasion was, um, was the International Day for the Rights of Domestic Workers. So we got domestic workers to come together to do an indoor protest. So uh, some of the placards that you can see them holding up rights to annual leave, right to public holiday, ratify the International Labour Organization, C189, decent work for domestic workers. Yeah, so, so these are opportunities that we try to create for domestic workers to be able to speak up um, for themselves and, and rally together and to feel empowered as a community.
Okay, so um, I just want to uh, maybe do a few, spend some time um, reflecting on the images that I have shown, um, talking in particular about how we show allyship and how we amplify workers' voices and how can we provide spaces for workers to resist and to talk back and to raise issues in an authoritarian context. And um, I think one of the most important things um, as an ally, because as a Singaporean or, and, as an, and as an employee of an organization with resources, um, it's important to be able to use our privilege and our resources to amplify these workers' voices. So, um, so the blog that we set up, for example, for the SMRT workers is, is one. Um, using our context and our connections and creating opportunities for workers to to talk to decision makers, so like for example their embassies or or, or even to the uh, yeah talking to their embassies and um, to em employer groups or even to the uh, agencies associations. So we try as much as possible to create these kinds of spaces and within the public sphere so that um, migrant workers can engage and communicate. Um, and it's also important to build relationships with the community and how we try to do that is really to start from where the community is. They may not necessarily want, like the community of domestic workers and migrant workers may not necessarily want to come together because um, they want to talk about their rights. Yeah, it can be seen as something that is dry and boring. Yeah, so one way in which we start building rapport with the community is to, is to start with activity they enjoy, yeah, like um, fashion shows, um, beauty pageants, um, dance and singing competitions. So, so this is a way in which we can get an entry point into the community and, and then eventually organize them to talk about issues which are important and, and which matter to them. Um, it's also important to, um, it, despite the very strict rules and laws within Singapore's authoritarian, authoritarian context, um, there are also loopholes and little gaps that you can, you can make use of. Like for example, the indoor rally that I talked about um, that would have been illegal if we did it like out of outdoors, but because there was an indoor rally and it was um, by invitation only, we didn't invite members of the public um, to come, so therefore we hadn't violated any laws, so it was possible to have that rally. Um, and um, finally, I also like to echo um, what Koki had said earlier about the importance of um, freedom of expression freedom of assembly, our civil and political rights, um, because it's so, imp it's so important to see that um, having a more democratic culture, a more democratic, uh, when we have the right to speak up and to speak our own truths, um, we will be able to advocate for issues more effectively. And history has shown that uh, a lot of progress comes because those who are marginalized and those who are vulnerable are the ones who advocate for themselves. So Singaporeans, like me can be their allies and try to amplify their voices, but true empowerment comes when they are able to organize themselves, they can form their own unions, form their own associations, and speak their own truths to power. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you much, so Koki. Much. Thank you so Thank much, Jolavan. That was a beautiful conversation and almost a, a history lesson of migrant worker organizing all the way um, uh, from the past to the contemporary context of COVID-19. Um, I want to begin by asking you to unpack a little bit more about the various layers of the concept of communicative equality. Because you see, it seems like there are at least three specific layers. One is communicative equality within migrant worker spaces. So if you think about the distribution of power within migrant worker spaces, these forms of power are unequally distributed and there might be issues of inequality within such spaces such that different uh, workers have access to different uh, levels of voice. The second is the communicative um, inequality between workers and civil society organizations and activists and um, Singaporeans that are working with them. And the third layer is the communicative inequalities between civil society organizations, activists, and the state. 
right? So if you think about uh, communicative inequality in these three layers, I would love to hear from you, um, sort of in terms of your own work, uh, which of these levels have you addressed? And like, be careful and not say this and not say that. Yeah. So, so I've all, so that has always been a bit of a, a challenge in terms of negotiating these kinds of boundaries. So over the years, we've learned what are some of the more sensitive issues uh, to talk about and those that are less sensitive. So can can we like go for the jugular on this, but then tread a little bit more carefully for another issue? Yeah. So there's this constant dance, right, and this constant negotiation of boundaries. Um, and then in, in terms of the communicative equality with the workers, I think that's also something which uh, I would struggle with. I struggle with a lot also because sometimes a lot of the workers that you talk to may not um, have values, you know, or views that that um, are aligned with yours, right? So how then do you create that kind of space for for diversity of views to come up, but at the same time um, um, get views which will benefit the community, uh, get them out publicly in the open, and 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 how 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 then when in the in your attempts to to do that, you know, what kind of um, trouble could you get into, how do you deal with differences among the community? So, so these are things which uh, require a lot of deep listening. Yeah, and then thinking about uh, which aspect of the community's voices to, to reflect, yeah, to, to highlight. For instance, I'll, I'll give one very concrete example um, of um, Philip. Okay, there was one time um, I was asked by an activist in the Philippines to be in solidarity with activists there over the market. So then I held up a sign that said, Marcos is not a hero. Yeah, but then all the migrant domestic workers started verbally abusing me and saying that Marcos is our hero. How dare you? <laughs> so, so, um, so when there are differences in opinion then, so um, how, 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 do we, how do we engage? Yeah, how then do I, at the same time, being very conscious of my, my privilege and then at the same time, um, engage at, at a level where I can get my points of view across. I, I think, of course, we should always speak our minds and say what we want to say because we don't want to be patronizing as well. Yeah. But um, when we're talking about issues, it's always it has it's important to to be mindful of um, your your nationality, your gender, who, who you are when you are within that kind of space. Yeah. And I'm also aware that sometimes when I talk about um, issues involving domestic workers' rights. There's a tendency to, for people to look at me as if I'm like an authority, um, and that I need then to um, be conscious of that and know when to pull back and when to come in. Yeah. So, so these kinds of dynamics, yeah, it requires I think skill and also experience in being able to navigate it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, Mohan, can you mute your mic? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, I can still hear feedback. Oh dear. Okay. Yeah. Now it's better. Okay. Um, so I think both in my um, experience or organizing um, migrant domestic workers, as well as um, families in um, rental flat neighborhoods in Singapore. I find that it is, it is, you know, you, you see the same kinds of complexities, politics, dynamics as you do in any kind of community, right? So there will always be people who are more vocal, uh, who are a bit more dominant in a space or who want, who take up more space and others who, who don't. And there are also power struggles, like power struggles are not just vertical, they are also horizontal, right? Like there are also... Um, those things that come up. And I think then our, our role is to be facilitators and hold the space for more honest discussions about these pain points um, so that they can be addressed and, and to sort of be power brokers in a sense. However, you know, I think challenging that is like, as in to point out or, or to create the space for people to surface those discomforts so that those, um, um, those things can be addressed sometimes. So it's not always easy to do, but I think that there are, there are other strategies around including different voices. Um, sometimes it's like deep one-to-one -one conversations, you know, in the, uh, you know, when you're having an, a meeting to discuss or you're trying to engage workers or 
families to discuss what policy recommendations you should make. Sometimes you can have focus groups, but you can also have one-to-one -one conversations to follow up to get the perspectives that didn't come up in the community discussion or in the focus group discussion. So you have to use, I think, a multitude of strategies to make sure that different voices are, are represented. And also in, um, I think there's also differences in, um, in, in the structurally of how different workers have voices. Like for example, I think we hear more uh, Bangladeshi workers' voices in public discourse here yeah, than Tamil workers amongst the men. And, and amongst uh, you know, domestic workers, we often hear Filipino and Indonesian uh, workers' voices more. So I think being mindful of, you know, sometimes the natural conditions that have led to this, um, that there are bigger groups of them or more of them can speak English that then gives them access. Um, so, and, and sometimes NGOs tend to target or work with groups where there are so many more of them, right? So for the longest time, there wasn't a Tamil or South Asian women's uh, uh, domestic worker support group. And then three years ago, we started the first one. So I think it's about trying to find uh, the gaps and then organizing people because they, they cannot, they always feel stronger when they, when they have collectives, right? Rather than asking like, you know, one Tamil worker to speak up, it's easier if they feel like they're part of something bigger and they have, and they have an identity and a stake in that. Um, but I think as a, and, you know, when it's the question of, of um, state versus activist and those communicative inequalities, then it, I think solidarity makes a big difference and amplifying each other's voices. I think, I think we have to make it costly to the state to censure us. And I think that is how we can mitigate the inequality that exists in that, um, you know, if, if the, the state has to be put in a position such that if they were to shut us down or, or sue us, that the public backlash has to be uh, formidable for them. So I think that kind of creating solidarity, allyship, uh, the collectivity is what might protect us from these inequalities. Beautiful. You know, one of the paths uh, to this conversation seems to be uh, in terms of cultivating a habit of or an ethic of listening, you know, and, and learning to listen as we talk about in the work of uh, care. Um, how do we build an ethic of listening, not only to that which we can hear, but that which is unheard and that which is missing? And I think, Koki, you kind of point this out also in terms of um, even worker voice. It's not just that which is convenient and easily accessible, but that which isn't, right? Uh, going back to the question of voice infrastructure, though, I want to build on that a little bit, because it seems like workers do speak up, right? And when they speak up in ways that matter, like Jolovan, your examples of uh, workers protesting, it's um, like speaking up to the end. End meaning that when they do speak up in that kind of way, the discursive register works such that they are going to be deported back or they're going to be incarcerated. There are going to be pretty dramatic consequences. So I guess within that setting, uh, the question is what can Singaporeans do? I mean, you talked about um, you know putting up the blog to amplify their voices, but um, in terms of material consequences, that actually feels very little in terms of uh, what the workers that actually are protesting have to face, you know? So I, do you have any thoughts about that? Right, yeah, it's, um, the thing about the consequences is that I think it's, it's, it's something which is very difficult um, to prevent from happening because Singaporeans generally, in my experience, would not have much solidarity over over these kinds of things, and there is a general attitude of, well, you know, they they knew what they were going in for, so then they have to accept um, the punishment, and um, and there's a tendency not to see these kinds of resistance as legitimate. Um, there is uh, the, the the very the prevailing view here is that you know you should go through proper channels, right, to. To, um, to file your complaints, you know, Singapore, we are we are a nation that's ruled rule of law. Um, we have sound institutions, so you shouldn't take matters into your own hands. Yeah. So 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 then to have that kind of collective solidarity around these workers would be extremely difficult. Yeah. So um, but I think what's important also is that many of these workers also knew that um, these were the consequences and they were prepared to accept them. 
and I think that's very powerful. At, at the same at time, the it same does time. seem like when that happens, it does send out a message that, uh, like you said, like you said uh, that uh, going that forward, going workers forward, are not going to not. speak up because that's the precedent that has been set up, isn't it? Yeah, and this is why um, the solidarity from Singaporeans is in So, I mean, it's not to say that um, Singaporeans won't be in solidarity with them at all. So if you talk about, say, the bus strike that happened in 2012 with the SMRT bus drivers, and there were a couple of um, civil society groups that did sign a statement to say, to urge the government to drop the charges. Yeah, But it's always um, just a small minority of groups who are willing to to speak up and to and be in solidarity. And it's not enough to create an impact. It's not enough to make it costly for the state um, to, to persecute them. I mean, if, if I can add in, I, I think that if we can also explore ways that we can materially support workers who are activists in these terms, right? So, you know, I think sometimes in civil society, in, among Singaporean activists too, like if somebody like, loses their job or is fined or, or, you know, is, is in any other way facing state persecution, other activists do rally around and say, you know, can we contribute financially? Can we help you out in this period? And I wonder if we can also extend that kind of support to migrant workers who are putting their bodies on the line, right? Like whether it, it ends with like, oh, they, they've accepted these consequences and therefore we can't do much or whether we can look for strategies, like are there other employers that might be willing to hire them if it was the employer that sent them back, for example, and can we cultivate those relationships and advocate for them to re-enter? Or, um, you know, even, even if it is through networks in other countries where they could go to work, you know, and, and trying to build those networks to support them or creating a fund to aid workers who are displaced, who are returned home, at least to relieve that burden. You know, so like, like, so kind of, and, and then doing all that mitigation work as part of preparing for their protest, as part of preparing for their action, like, so understanding what each of their risks are, how much debt they have, and how much resources we can rally to alleviate that, so that they're not just left in the lurch. I think those kinds of strategies also have to be explored so that we can materially support workers. Great point. So, you know, one of the things in this conversation which becomes um, um, quite interesting to observe is that uh, we talk about ways of mitigating. What about changing the policy framework itself? Sorry, I didn't. Sorry, I didn't. What are the processes involved in changing the policy framework itself so that uh, workers actually have those kinds of rights to be able to articulate? What would take us to get there? <laughs> Jolivan, you're muted. Okay, I, I think um, for a start, I, we, we need to, I think NGOs, activists and, and people and community workers in general need to understand that um, a lot of their work is political, right? And that um, a, a more democratic Singapore is what's needed in order for these things to happen. So which means you need to incorporate um, advocacy for civil and political rights as part of your work. Yeah, but but once you start doing that, you are punished, right? Yeah. So a lot of a lot of activists or NGOs don't want to do that, yeah, because it means that they they won't get funding, they might lose patronage. Yeah. So, um, but if you look at a country like Hong Kong, for instance, yeah, where domestic workers they really have rights. Um, they at least they have more rights than the migrant workers here in Singapore. They can form their own unions, and a politician says. Um, something racist about them, they, they pick it outside her office. Yeah. So because these rights exist, so they have a, a way to resist and to talk back and to, and to, and, and to advocate for themselves. So um, how do we get there? I think we, we really need to start thinking about our work as political yeah, and not just treat it as providing services, it's charity, or, or even if we are involved in advocacy, only, only focus very narrowly on a certain 
issue that relates to women's rights or uh, disabilities rights. So we have to go broader. We have to be, you know, we have to expand the scope of our advocacy. Uh, but there are risks that come with that. Uh, so it's a catch-22 situation. Right? It's, a, it's a dilemma for a lot of um, activists. I mean, I think just two, two other things that are already happening that Jolivan did mention um, that I think will help in expanding more space in, in terms of policy for, for workers to have voice is, the, is you know, challenging the, the tied work permit system, which has been going on for a long time. So at least then the layer of censure that comes from employers can be removed, you know, wh while it might still be risky to speak up against the state, you know, that is still, it, I think a lot of the inhibition is just because they, they will be, they will lose their jobs. And if they're, they're allowed to freely change employers, um, I think migrant workers will be able to speak up more about the injustices they face at work too. And then the advocacy to, I think embassies is another valuable area because we've seen how when, when the sending countries, governments then institute certain policies for the protection of their workers that um, the, the receiving country has, has I think it, it helps to, um, you know, have that kind of uh, um, inter-intergovernmental kind of pressure as well, so that you know Singapore then has to oblige by these things that their governments are demanding and the workers are demanding from their governments to demand of Singapore. What about uh, now? Go ahead, Jolova. And also the recruitment debts, right, that they have, and one of the reasons they're very compliant is because they are in debt. So I think if we can deal with that issue, then um, they will be more willing to take risks. Yeah. What is the role of um, international organizations, such as the um, International Labour Organization, for instance, within this context? Um, well, I'm not sure how much what much they can do, actually, <laughs> given their very... Uh, I mean, if you talk about an organization like the International Labour Organization, um, it, it's, it, it's, it's actually a, an inter... It, it's a tripartite organization consisting of the government, the unions, and, and the employers. So international organizations that best can help set standards for, for workers and maybe help build capacity um, for workers to be able to um, uh, to to learn more about um, rights-based issues um, and yeah, so basically, I think I see their role more as standard setting and and capacity building. Yeah. I think that we can look at different forms of um, allyship that we can cultivate for migrant workers to strengthen their position here, right? So for example, you know, even building solidarities between uh, migrant workers and local low wage workers or migrant workers and, and um, low income migrant spouses who, who are both migrants, migrant communities and face a lot of um, um, disenfranchisement here. I think when they have more, more allies in, in communities that uh, uh, part of Singapore's fabric, you know, so that they're not seen as a, just in a silo, the migrant workers uh, and migrant workers' issues is unrelated and not interconnected to everybody else's. I think it is also easier to, to advocate. And if we advocate for more broad-based labor rights, it's also easier for migrant workers' rights to be included and articulated through that. And I think similarly, there are, um, you know, um, uh, with, with it, it's creating networks for them regionally and internationally too with other migrant worker groups you know so so i think that networks of support really strengthen um vulnerable communities right so whether it is intercommunity or whether it is their people in their situation but in other contexts i think cultivating those connections is a valuable way to strengthen their position now let's turn a little bit to you because you know in each of your roles you have foregrounded how the work of solidarity is so important in addressing a broader culture of fear. So I wanted to ask a two-part question. The first part is, do you experience fear when speaking up? And the and second part the second of that part question part. is, when do you do experience fear, uh, what are the ways in which um, you negotiate it? 
Coquilla you start. Yo, you think I really are you want to? Um, I think yes, fear is definitely something which everyone experiences, um, and I think um, when I started out earlier on, I was definitely more conscious of it and felt the need to um, have to address it, or at least I, I felt more scared than I did now. Um, but I think over time, um, through pushing the boundaries bit by bit, um, through a kind of incremental approach that has helped me um, grapple and deal with it so so that when something happens to you, like say for instance you're arrested or you're charged in court or, or a minister sends you a letter demanding you to apologize, you'll be able to kind of deal with it because um, um, having pushed the boundaries slowly and increasing your threshold slowly, that helps you to acclimatize and get used to it. Um, and I think it also comes through a lot of um, reflection, um, reflecting a lot about your work and what matters to you. So I think the kinds of values which are important to you and, and, and what you are willing to, to do to put those values into action, I think, um, for me at least, once I'm very clear about that, um, the fear then is just something which I can address as a secondary issue because then the things which matter to me more are able to help me manage that, yeah. Yeah, um, I think for me that, uh, I mean, I definitely echo a lot of what Jolvin just said. Um, so there are a few things. I think one of the things that is most demoralizing for me is, um, is if civil society peers are not are unsupportive. Like that used to, I think, um, get me down the most when, when we speak up um, on, on things that are more uncomfortable or inconvenient or a bit more confrontational than some others are comfortable with, then to be, I think, scolded by civil society peers for not being um, pragmatic or you know even sometimes doing a disservice to the movement or to activists. I think those things were harder for me when I was a bit younger. Um, because there's sometimes there can be a lot of gaslighting, you know, like your employers, you know, at an advocacy group telling you that you are throwing marginalized communities under the bus through speaking up or, you know, just things like that can be quite, quite challenging, I think, to work through. So I think clarity on why we do what we do and who we stand with and our values is really helpful in, in holding on to what, you know, you know to be real in the midst of some gaslighting. But then uh, for me, the f um, I think more than fear of censure or like state persecution and different, like, you know, whether it's like um, legal prosecution or whatever, what really um, um, concerns me is, is livelihood, right? Like as in, because I, I've been, my job has been threatened before multiple times and, you know, I haven't been able to get a job. <laughs> so it's, I think those difficulties after some time become very like practical worries and uh, when you have, a lot of financial insecurity and uh, um, so I think that's sort of what what concerns me more than um, fear of you know just state bullying or other forms of state persecution yeah everybody is muted yeah I'm, I, I unmuted myself. So it seems like to this process of creating communicative inequality. So to me, as an observer of Singapore, it seems that communicative inequality is actively created. And part of that is the politics of stigmatization. So that someone becomes so stigmatized that no one will touch with a 10 foot pole, you know? Um, so I can't be seen with Jolovan in a public place we cannot be seen uh, talking uh, on a forum because uh, these are considered ways of stigmatization, the ways in which stigmatization works. So uh, I guess uh, to me, it seems like if you want to change it, part of the challenge is how do you change this work of stigmatization that actually builds and circulates these inequalities, you know?
Joe, you're, you're muted. Oh, what, what is the... I, I didn't get the question, I'm sorry. So the observation I'm making, so Joe, is that uh, part of the work of building the communicative inequality is to actively stigmatize. Uh, stigmatize people that speak up. So if you want to challenge that and change it, it seems like you have to build a culture that um, actively resists these kinds of stigmatization, you know? So how do you do that? Um, I think building networks of support are important and um, getting together with like-minded people. Um, I think when you build a community of uh, actors and, uh, and activists who share your same values and views, it will be easier for you to to um, make progress yeah, on trying to make these kinds of, um, to destigmatize basically uh, a lot of these very sensitive issues. So I think we really need to, um, because it, I think there's a tendency maybe for different groups to, and or maybe different groups of, different groups and maybe different activists to work in silos and be on their own. So, and because of the lack of collective uh, sense of community, then it's more difficult for um, solidarities to be uh, to be built. Yeah. So we need to have that if we want to chip away at the stigma. So I think I think two things, right? One is I think it's very difficult for um, I think like what Jolivan said in, in terms of finding a community of like-minded people that that just helps you preserve your sanity, right? But I don't know that it actually um, works to fight the stigmatization on a public uh, platform because the forces that stigmatize you to me just feel really <laughs> overpowering. Like there's so much more powerful. Like there's you know concerted campaigns like you know petitions against us you know name calling is like traitors or you know like and, and Kirsten has faced I think the brunt of a lot of this but it just so much um coordinated action it appears to to stigmatize that I don't know how um publicly uh, just having a group of friends that supports us so it definitely helps very much on a personal level but I think um the second point Jolivan made about Solidarity. I think for more established groups, the groups that are more palatable, um, that are seen as, as you know less controversial, I think they need to speak in solidarity too. I think that can help to um, mitigate some of the stigma. And I think irreverence helps. I don't know if that makes sense. But you know, in general, I think like um, like for me, it's really helpful to point out to people that, you know, Jolivan is, like, it's really funny to me that people might see him as some kind of, like, fierce, angry, scary person. <laughs> He's, like, really, you know, quite a cartoon. So I think highlighting those those sides of our friends is actually quite helpful. <laughs> I don't know if this seems like a silly thing to say, but, but I think it just disrupts that narrative that's painting us out to be some kind of, like, very, I don't know, reckless, out there, scary figures or, or um, yeah, just negative um, forces, right? So I think irreverence and, and humor and like just like day-to-day -day, um, aspects of our, of our work, I think helps with that too. Um, highlighting not just what, what, you know, Jolivan does as an activist, but what he does as a social worker. Not that, you know, we should have to make him more palatable, but those are like, they're all multi-dimensional aspects of his reality, right? Of his work. So why should one be foregrounded at the cost of or to in in invisibilize everything else he does? So, yeah. Excellent. I will go to some audience questions now. Um, and there are some really good questions that our um, audience have shared with us. One of the questions, um, you know, somebody thanks you for raising uh, the voices of uh, Tamil workers, uh, for instance, and you kind of addressed that. Um, so uh, one of the questions is, how can you um, be, make sure that you're attending to uh, the particular kinds of spaces uh, that really need these infrastructures for voice? How, how do we ensure that we're attending to the, yeah, I think, it's, it's something that I think, you know, you, Mohan, often say uh, with regard to um, 
paying attention to the margins of margins, right? So I think it is um, that being a, a part of your critical framework in approaching um, solidarity work with marginalized communities, like thinking about and, and actively um, extending friendship to and trying to discover the spaces where people who's, who are missing from the, the current narrative and, and the, whose visibility is you know, um, more diminished. I think that it's that work. Um, and yeah, I think we, we did talk about a bit of this before, but yeah, just trying to identify those gaps and then organizing that community so that, it, especially because they are already vulnerable, it's harder for them to speak as individuals, I think, but to, um, first form friendships. And I think Jodhavan also spoke to this a bit through other things, right? Like, can we just come together for a meal or come together to, to learn who each other is before we talk about things like advocacy and, and things that are maybe a bit more intimidating or difficult for these communities to engage with. I think it's also that different groups, you know, have different kinds of relationships to the state. Like we find that some groups are a bit more suspicious of the state, you know, some are a bit more, um, afraid of the state too than others. And I think there are multiple factors in how that is set up, um, you know, starting from um, like how big their community is and uh, how much other people from within their community they have seen speak up that they can take reference from and all of that. But I think we have to um, respect always like where people are at, right? So if they're not ready to or willing to speak up more publicly or have their accounts shared, or if they take a very strong position, which some people do, right? Uh, who, people who live on the margin saying, no, what I what is there is enough and I don't want to challenge this, then that also needs to be respected, I think. You know, one of the things we both talked about was this idea of consent and informed consent, that seems to be so vital to communicative um, equality. Can you talk about that, particularly in terms of, uh, particularly in terms of the tendency to get carried away, uh, to represent a particular migrant worker narrative because it fits our agenda, uh, and how that actually might perpetuate these fundamental communicative inequalities? Sorry, I, I didn't hear the full question. So my question is that so um, question is when that you talk about the issue of informed consent, uh, it, it seems to be that that is so vital and, and yet sometimes uh, we might not go through that process of securing consent because the narrative fits into a pre-configured agenda in terms of what one is trying to advocate for as an activist or an advocate. Uh, from the standpoint of communicative equality, it seems like that too is a form of violence because you have fundamentally violated the right to dignity and voice of someone at the margins to co-opt that. So I would love to hear you speak about that and how you bring that into your own practice. Um, yeah, that's of often difficult because when you are dealing with vulnerable communities and you want them to share, um, and you ask them to share, and sometimes you wonder the extent to which they are sharing it's because they've asked you, you've asked them to do it, and then and maybe they feel maybe uh, indebted to you. Yeah, so, so I'm always quite conscious of these kinds of um, uh, barriers to communication because especially, say, like in, in home, for instance, it runs a shelter, so you're literally like responsible for um, their, their basic um, uh, livelihood, right? So, so there's always that kind of barrier where they feel that if I, s if I said no to this person, um, am I being ungrateful? Yeah, so I think, um, uh, for me, I feel that consent in these kinds of um, situations um, is something then that you need time, yeah, and to not let people rush through their decision and to always be very clear that, hey, you know, you can say no, you don't have to feel bad because I'm asking you. Yeah, so, um, so I think what, what's important is that I think um, the vulnerable person in the community has the time and the opportunity to think through things. And sometimes this isn't helpful if the journalist is just like, you know, <laughs> uh, 
wanting an answer, you know, wanting a worker to interview and say, ah, my deadline is like in tomorrow or in two days' time. You need to, I need to have someone by then. And I'm like, you know, but this person may not be so sure whether he, he wants to talk to you or not. So, so I think, uh, but ultimately, I think if the interview doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Yeah, because it's important that these are decisions that they make and not decisions that we make. Though it's often very tempting, you know, it's like, oh, why don't you do the interview? You know, you tell yourself that because you think that this is such an important issue. So that's why a lot of checking is required. Yeah. It, it Just what Joe said. Like it, 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 it also seems like, you know, cultivating some kind of like radical communicative equality that is based on the idea of relationship and commitment is really important so that um, a low wage migrant worker is not just a source of a story, uh, but really someone who could be one's friend. Isn't that fundamentally the beginning of solidarity, you know? Yes. Yeah, I think it's really important that, that from the beginning, the, the relationships are built as peers. So I think then that, that helps to disrupt these possibilities of, of, you know, indebtedness that I need to do it because you have asked. And, you know, I think disrupting those more hierarchical power relationships from the get-go, I think is really important. You know, like when I worked at an NGO that worked with um, um, low-income communities and rental flats, there was... You know, there's this always the sense that they are members of this organization. They were never described to begin with as clients or as beneficiaries, but that, you know, we are, we are members and they are members. So we are all peers in trying to address shared concerns and shared aspirations, though we have obviously different privileges and different um, backgrounds. And then to bring those privileges into the space and name them um, and, and forge friendships, um, you know, uh, across our our lived experiences and I think it would manifest in things like how if you know if a if a community worker was hospitalized members from the community would go and visit right so then they would do things I think reciprocity is also really valuable to communities on the margins being able to care for you while you care for them and I think that is often the uh, foundation of an of an equal uh, relationship that where, where their dignity is is protected so I think if those are the relationships we have formed, then the ways in which we create space for their stories can never undermine their dignity because you've not created the infrastructure for that from the get-go. Beautiful. You know, there is a beautiful question here, uh, which sort of asks us to um, move a little bit back in Singapore history and look at solidarity between uh, low-wage uh, migrant workers and low-wage uh, Singapore um, uh, workers. Um, I know, Koki, you have talked about this in our personal conversations at, at certain points. Um, uh, so, you know, it seems like there was a history at some point in terms of that kind of friendship between um, uh, Singaporean workers and uh, migrant workers. Uh, what is your sense of um, uh, that kind of possibility now? I, I think that one of the barriers is that we don't, we rarely, I find here in Singapore, articulate um, local low wage workers issues as labor issues, right? Because they are, uh, I think that there was definitely a point in time, if you look at like the Jurong Industrial Mission and in the, in the, you know, that period of work in the, I think, 70s and 80s where, you know, volunteers were working with workers in the factories and things. There was a much stronger articulation of workers' rights, of labor rights. Um, but now it is largely in discourse framed as low-wage families, right? As a low-income households or low-income families, which I think automatically works to depoliticize the issue as not a labor rights issue. So then it's about like, you know, community building and community development and, and food distributions and, you know, all these other forms of um, depoliticizing poverty and, and low wage, um, like, and the conditions of low wage workers. Yeah, so I think we first need to articulate challenges of low wage workers. And, and I think the identity of them as workers needs to be centered um, when, for solidarity to be possible with migrant workers too. 
also need to we also need to um, create spaces where migrant workers and local workers can come together because at the moment now everything is everyone's working in isolation um, and it's difficult to do that because the NTUC monopolizes the, mo the labor movement so you can't have like an alternative labor movement or even if you can it's going to you know you're, go you're going to encounter a lot of obstacles in trying to to build that yeah so, um, so, so 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 the challenge is also very structural in that sense yeah because of the way the state has monopolized all the civil society space I think it's also, also noteworthy that you know that the state is also built um, very clear divides between local workers and migrant workers by pitting them against each other, and that narrative first needs to be challenged because a lot of working class Singaporeans see migrant workers as their threat competition because the state has set it up that way, right? Stealing our jobs and and you know depressing wages, and and I think those that. It's, it's already created a very strong rift between these communities and a lot of antagonism. I mean, it is. I think it is no secret that a lot of the racism and xenophobia directed at migrant workers does come from working class Singaporeans because of these narratives. And I think that needs to be um, first challenged too. I mean, you know, the literature would suggest one way to challenge that is by building class consciousness. Just saying. Can't hear you, Jolovan. Oh, sorry. Um, and also to see how the exploitation of like low wage workers, low wage migrant workers, and low wage local workers are, are connected, right? Yeah, because um, the reason local workers' wages are depressed is because migrant workers are easy to exploit, right? So if we have like greater protections for migrant workers, then um, Singaporean workers will also benefit as well. So being able to make these kinds of connections. Great. I will ask you, we are moving toward wrapping this up. This has been such an excellent uh, discussion. I will ask you the last two questions. One question is from our audience about um, your experience with embassies. How do you think they have been responding? Uh, do you think they are uh, enabling um, ways of addressing these communicative um, inequalities or are they exacerbating them? Well, I think with embassies, it tends to be quite, um, I mean, you, 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 you get embassy officials coming to dialogue and all that, but, but in the end, a, a lot of the substantive issues don't really get addressed. Yeah. So, um, and embassies, sometimes um, they may perpetuate that communicative inequality when they, when they become patronizing, um, when they when they start to scold the workers even. So we've heard such stories before. And, um, and embassies also, some embassies also run shelters and they may not run shelters in a rights-based kind of way. Yeah, which, so that makes it difficult for workers to be able to speak up. So, so embassies, um, most people's impression of embassies is that they will help foreign nationals, right? But there's also a class element to it. So if you are, an expat, so of course, then the embassy official speaks to you in a different way. But if you're working class, Filipino, Indonesian, or Indian, so you know the 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 dynamic is different. Yeah, and what I've also heard from some workers is they say that some embassies tell them, you know, you are privileged to be able to come to Singapore to work. Yeah, you your brethren, you know, back in your own country isn't able to come here. So what are you complaining about? So it seems like there's quite a bit of variance, but also quite a bit of space in terms of moving embassies in this direction of communicative equality. Um, Koki and Joe, I wanted to ask if you had uh, any questions that you wanted to pose in this conversation. Hmm. To you, Mohan? You know? Uh, huh. I guess I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm always grappling. I don't know whether this is a question I'm posing to anyone in particular, but I'm always grappling with, um, you know, like some of the things that you brought up, like how do we, what is the work of creating 
class consciousness look like in Singapore? Like, you know, and, and, and we're building a working class movement and creating the space for that. Um, I, I think, yeah, I always feel at a loss and also about, you know, when it comes to challenging communicative inequalities with the state. Like, you know, a lot of the questions you asked, I was like, wow, I don't know, right? Like, I don't know what to do about these things. And I think that's what a very, sometimes in a very authoritarian environment maybe um, suffocates our imagination on what is possible. And uh, so I definitely, uh, I think, feel like I want to learn a lot about the different possibilities for creative resistance and like building a more democratic culture in general so that, um, because that is what I think will pave the way for marginalized communities to have voice for themselves um, and you know stop this kind of proxy type situation that we have going on here. Yeah. Joe, did you want to respond to Koti? I, I do have to. I think she said everything so well. Yes, she has. Yes, you she know. Has. <laughs> she really, she really has. <laughs> I, I want to piggyback on that and say that. Um, you know, what Jolovan, you talked about in terms of just getting spaces to converse and uh, spaces that actually um, uh, defy these boundaries and these logics. Uh, the thing is that the state has created these silos, right? So you have your NTUC, you have your CCs and RCs, and then you have migrant worker activism. Um, uh, so it's like three separate entities. Uh, that also walk into the state's logic of managing um, the population in particular ways. So breaking those boundaries and opening up spaces of conversation, uh, to me, you know, seems like a great way to actually uh, create spaces for articulations, you know? Maybe if I can just, because what you just said reminded me of something, if I can just add on, is that, um, I think that often that, that is, you know, when we talk about communicative equality, it is also to me um, ensuring that marginalized groups have access to um, analysis and information on policy levels too that they can engage with, you know, like, like having discussions about the national budget with low income communities or with migrant workers. Like we need to be doing that too. And I've, I've often found it to be a really powerful experience when I do share data and, um, you know, um, um, policy frameworks and legislative frameworks with groups that they have so many uh, insightful opinions. And, and, it, and it is immediately, I think, also politicizing. Maybe that is then the work of raising class consciousness or political consciousness, right? Where I've seen where in the beginning of a, of a community conversation in a rental flat neighborhood about poverty and everyone is kind of repeat, starting off with the state narrative, right? Of, oh, you know, we are grateful for what the government is doing. We are lucky to get what we get and we just need to work harder. And that is why we are where we are. Then when we share data about um, inequality in Singapore, about median wage, you know, median income here, and all sorts of just other figures of different housing types and, and costs of living and things. And then at the end of this data sharing exercise, the same people are going, you know what, it's really unfair you know, this environment we live in, you know, and, and it is not that it's a new thought, but I think us sharing this and talking to them uh, on as peers, you know, who are trying to grapple with our society together, then creates permission for anger, creates permission for indignation and for that solidarity. And it's also about them seeing, I mean, there is this nice, I think, illustration, um, which talks about how if you think it's only your problem, then it is a hardship, but if it's shared, then it's a grievance, right? So when they're also able to hear each other's stories and see that, oh, you know, I'm not the only one, so this is systemic. I think those are, you know, we need to be moving in those directions of having deeper, converse <clears throat> deeper conversations about our shared values as a society, discussing system structures with them too, yeah. Um. And also, I think um, for me, there's this gap between people who are interested and, or, and people who are aware, and then what actions to take. Yeah, because there is a sense, I think, among people in the community of learned helplessness, which is that um, not much is going to change 
Yeah, and especially among migrant workers, because they say things like, you know, I'm, I'm a foreigner anyway. Um, the, the government can revoke my permit anytime, and um, I can lose my job. So what's the point of doing this? What's the point of taking these risks? Yeah. So so I think, yeah. How how then do we bridge this gap? Yeah, where people want to do something but then feel that they can't. And I, I love the example that you used, Sholofan, where you demonstrated that how by the act of speaking up, there is actually change that happens. And I love that in your op-ed as well that you wrote, um, how, where you demonstrated that, yeah, indeed, you know, speaking up um, is inconvenient, but through that process, it actually does bring about change. So maybe part of it is also to uh, hold up those examples. You muted. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, to model what you want to see. So, so when you, when that, the imagination that you have, this, this alternative that you want, then you, you need to go about. You, you need to take action and do it for yourself, so that people can see it happening. Yeah. Yeah, and I think yeah, and I wherever we have the opportunity, we have to pass the mic. Right. I think that is a very easy thing to keep remembering <laughs> that um you know in any situation if we are invited to speak if we, is it does, does it have to be me or can it be a member of the community and only if it is unsafe for them or they are unwilling then we do but our first i think go to has to be can the community speak yeah absolutely yes. a great starting point of this would be to actually see more uh, voices of migrant workers in media stories and in media narratives you know um, yeah. And one of the things that's been interesting, you know, Sadhveer has been uh, doing a study of the media coverage of COVID-19 in the dormitories. And one thing she's been saying is that in the content analysis, she's been observing more migrant worker voices. And I think a lot of that has to do with your advocacy for exactly this idea of passing the mic. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> Excellent. I just want to take this moment to thank you both uh, for this conversation. It has been such a learning journey for me to uh, hear you both speak and learn from your experience. And I'm sure it's been that way with our audience. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Koki, and thank you so much, uh, Jolovan. Uh, for our audience, thank you for joining yes. us. Hopefully there are lessons here that we can each take within our own context. Thank you, Mohan. You were awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Bye. You are awesome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.